kia ora for, for GOC Anya. Really great to be here. Um, yeah, just as Hamish mentioned, um, yeah, really thrilled to be here and, and present um, at this really awesome forum on geospatial technology, open source and open data. Um, personally, really sad not to be at the conference um, and to be able to present in person. Uh, unfortunately, just, um, yeah, just something came up with my fiance that meant that I couldn't come across at the last minute. So uh, apologies for that. Um, but uh, thankfully, we've got the internet and we go back to uh, maybe some nostalgic times with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. And uh, hopefully this Aussie uh, national broadband can hold out for 30 minutes. Um, you know, just personally, if there was any conference um, that I could dream up to, to ever want to attend, it would definitely be this one. There's certainly uh, three of my largest passions, open source, geospatial technology, and, and open data. That's it for me. Um, I live and breathe that stuff. Um, you know, and I, I think it's a really great, passionate, and, and all-encompassing community. Um, yeah, so I hope you guys have a really, really good um, week and uh, manage to get a lot out of it. Um, yeah, I'm here today really just to, I think, share a few insights, uh, sort of my views is, is how I see the overall geospatial and open data geospatial landscape shaping up and, you know, how, you know, what we've done in the past can, uh, you know, be supporting us, uh, you know, now and, and what we can also do into the future to really try and tackle those tough challenges for New Zealand around urban development, climate change, resilience, uh, multi prosperity and in general, uh, New Zealand's well-being. And of course, that, that extends, I think, uh, to uh, across the ditch here. Right, so now let's get serious and get mapping into the future. So the power of geospatial, I mean, I think you guys obviously don't um, need like uh, any reminder of this, but I think it's really good just sort of sitting back and having a really good um, just look at this from the top. You know, from my perspective, you know, geospatial technology is nothing uh, short of magical. Uh, you know, we know all the powerful things that it can do, all the amazing kind of like technological and information things that are at our fingertips that can really help like change the way that we do things. It's basically, you know, something that we can use across all areas of, of society um, and uh, can really help solve really complex problems. You know, I think both uh, in, in Australia, but I like to have a little bias, particularly towards New Zealand, that we've got very, very strong um, geospatial data, um, you know, environments. And, you know, I think that really helps uh, provide impetus to this whole like geospatial environment that we've got. So, of course, you know, based on the principles and likely why a lot of us are here, you know, there's, there's probably, you know, a couple of like really key things which which I think really help drive, um, you know, the New Zealand and, and, and Australian environments as we have. So open source and open data have, have, have played no end of, um, I guess, uh, you know, execution and into the way that we do things and we deliver things around geospatial uh, technology and, and decision making. Um, you know, there's, there's countless examples where uh, both the government and also, um, you know, private sectors really stepped up to be able to, to leverage both of these things to try and provide information uh, to help solve problems that we have at hand. Um, you know, both this, this open data and, and this open uh, source uh, movement really are, are like a dynamic duo in my mind. Uh, they go hand in hand in helping to solve these complex challenges. And uh, I think in general, this really sort of pushes out to the broader IT industry. You know, the geospatial community is definitely building on the shoulders of, you know, some great open source and open data movements in general. Um, uh, what, what I personally feel, and I have a little bit of a bias towards this, so that, that I feel that the real secret sauce here um, is the open data. That for me is, is the gold. That's, that's the dragon's gold as such. And really that's, that's the thing that's really going to enable us and, and, and unlock us to, um, to get those key benefits that, that we need to have in, in society and solve those tough challenges. Um, you know, I, I've worked a lot in open source technology and it's definitely uh, very, very critical as well. But I do just have um, a little bit of a, a biased view that um, that the open data is something more of, um, 
you know, a high value item and also uh, some place where we've got a, a, a great number of barriers that I think we still need to keep working on to, to unlock. Of course, open data, um, you know, it's, it can in general be very, very expensive to procure. Um, and it's also um, becoming a really hot topic, particularly with um, AI and machine learning, which is again, you know, starting to again, make us rethink about our principles as to how we collect and share and uh, put like privacy safeguards around our information. I really just, um, you know, because obviously I work for the government, I really just want to touch on, I think that um, the government is, is both quite instrumental um, to helping to, um, to unlock the, the power of, of open data within our community. And, and also um, we, we also hold up or create barriers as well for probably to be able to unlock further value. Um, definitely we have um, a huge general uh, commitment to, to open data and we have policies in place which which go um, quite some time back that really make this um, you know make this possible for, for government agencies to invest in and to try and make this data available however um, you know for a lot of government agencies uh, you know some of these principles are really sort of like a, an add-on or a tack-on and uh, you know, it's it, it it may not actually get you know even while the policy is there, it may not actually be able to get the um, you know the changes or the operational changes that the community or or the users want. I definitely say that we've we've got huge uh, momentum in some agencies across government, and obviously uh, uh, you know Toy Two Percent of land information uh, really lives and breathes this uh, statistics, and Z breathes this. And uh, other agencies are also starting to, to get on board and really see the benefits of this. But we do have some challenges in our overall uh, government operating models. You know, we've got um, SOEs and, and CRIs, which have been fundamentally set up under the principles of, uh, of making profit or doing cost recovery. So we do still have challenges in this broader environment. And so, um, you know, we've still got to keep working on how we can uh, set the policy scene and remove some of these barriers to really uh, try and unlock all of that uh, potential benefit that we've got there. Because the government is a huge player in providing the geospatial information and provides a lot of foundational information that's going to help provide better decision making and, and drive uh, better outcomes for us all. So just bearing in mind, I mean, I think a lot of government agencies, you know, while they don't need, um, you know, to, to have the stick applied to them in terms of those policies and they're living and breathing and and uh, and, and trying to make this happen, um, I, I think it's, it's worthwhile, at least within, uh, you know, Toy Super Whenua and I know with other agencies across uh, New Zealand that, you know, we really do live an open philosophy. And we really see that on, on kind of like four key pillars. And I think this is very, very important um, in terms of, you know, the way that, you know, the broader community and other agencies should be trying to, to think about solving problems. We really see that, you know, providing the open data and making sure that there's open licensing that makes that open data easy to use and, and to legally, um, you know, uh, reuse that there is definitely uh, open standards and specifications, which is uh, you know, underpinning the way that uh, the data is actually uh, procured or collected and shared. And, uh, and also uh, that we are leveraging open source to make that happen. Um, you know, we do have to be pragmatists and, and not always um, you know, can we be leveraging open source, but I think when, whenever there's an opportunity to look at new system redevelopments, uh, to think about how we may be uh, providing uh, new toolkits and stuff is that open source should be thought about first and foremost. We've certainly got a lot of challenges there. There's a lot of um, legacy technology and systems in place uh, within our, uh, you know, within government and within our communities. And we've also got the, uh, the cloud and the SaaS movement, which is, of course is starting to, I guess, undermine a lot of open source value, which is something which is, uh, I guess quite a bit of a concern to the open source community. So 
but in general, I think open source is, is definitely something that we should be trying to leverage and definitely uh, within our agency, uh, we, we leverage it um, as, as much as possible. I think it's you know worthwhile just going back to the open data and, and to just have a bit of a recap of you know what Australia and New Zealand have been doing in terms of trying to unlock the uh, un unlock the value of geospatial data and really try and you know get those uh, complex decisions and, and challenges uh, better informed by this information. We've got these um, you know these uh, ten uh, themes that uh, ANZ has, has really been working on. Uh, over the really the last ten years, and probably more, really to, to try and unlock, we've we've made huge progress across this landscape. I mean, if I look back kind of uh, ten or fifteen years ago, you know, having imagery like fully open and available, having our address data um, available, you know, having uh, all of our our property information, uh, particularly survey and title information, uh, out there and available, it certainly um, it was certainly challenging, and in some cases, it was uh, really uh, impossible to get access to information. So we've made some really large uh, jumps, and I think we've got some good wins. Um, but there's still a really, really long way to go. And I think you know this is this is an ever evolutionary journey, and we've got to keep working on this, and we've got to keep uh, working as communities, and also. Um, you know, be lobbying government to make sure that we can really truly try and unlock this information and remove all those existing barriers, which are, I think, stopping some of the future things that we would like to do or making things definitely much, much more difficult for ourselves. So I think with that, what I'd like to do is to go through some, uh, some geospatial case studies where I think the use of, of open data and, and open source are, are really shining lights at the moment. And going through those case studies, I'd also like to touch on some of the challenges and issues um, which might point us to where um, we need to go for a future vision. So starting with Cyclone Gabriella, and I'm sure uh, you know all New Zealanders are, are fully appreciative of, of the challenges and, and the issues that New Zealand's just been through with that cyclone, and, and hopefully Australian colleagues are as well. Um, but there was um, obviously a massive uh, disaster in New Zealand caused by um, the cyclone this year. And geospatial information uh, was really there, I think, at the fore to really help um, support some of those those challenging problems, uh, you know that the uh, that the country had to face, and particularly in, in sort of the Gisborne and the Hawke's Bay area. Uh, Lynn's and and its partners, you know, worked together, um, you know, to make sure that we could uh, secure satellite imagery, sort of to help with the, you know, the um, the the support and and also the recovery, and so you know. Through our mechanisms that we had in place, through data distribution, through licensing, and through having agreements uh, in government to to go and procure imagery and, and to get it up and available, we were able to to make uh, imagery uh, available in, in a very rapid day, um, some quite fast turnarounds. And I think you know imagery is definitely a very very good story in New Zealand, and it really um, I think. Is, is probably one of those those key uh, gems in, in what, what we're doing and really does support a lot of broader geospatial use cases. Uh, of course, uh, we've got um, a elevation LIDAR program across New Zealand and we've, we've put in place uh, specifications and procurement processes uh, to start putting that in place for the whole country. Um, but on the back of that, you know, um, we we're able to leverage um, you know that work that we've done across the country in trying to uh, capture lidar and we can also um, put in place uh, mechanisms to to fly more lidar as it's required so in the case of the gabriel cyclone uh, we flew uh, some lidar around some of the particularly damaged areas around east valley during the response and we were able to use that um, the community was able to use that to basically look for a silt and, and erosion uh, very quickly. And all this information was published out wider as well for the broader community to be able to leverage. 
So this stuff is is really um, great information and, and essential geospatial data that really helps in that, that recovery. Um, we also are able to leverage um, radar um, and we, we've got capabilities uh, across governments that um, understand how to procure the, the radar and to also process it, as well as we have partnerships with other vendors that, uh, that collect that information and can turn that into products. So uh, working with uh, ESA and Sentinel, we, we were able to acquire some uh, synthetic aperture radar data and then we're able to, to use that um, to be able to, um, to process it, to turn it into, um, into flood areas that can then help with the recovery process. So this yet again is a, a really another strong example of, of how we're able to come together as geospatial community, get that information when we need it and turn it into um, higher um, value products to, to be able to use in the response. I think it's worth noting both with the satellite and also, um, you know, both for imagery and also for radar, we were able to work with the vendors to actually task the satellites to come over uh, you know, the affected areas, which was, I think, really essential in trying to make sure that we could get the data that we needed in, in the right time frame. So here's just an example of how using the 10 metre uh, imagery to be able to extract the uh, flood extents. So through Cyclone Gabriel, we had some good success stories there uh, with the uh, the imagery and uh, and the and the radar. But uh, I just want to touch on some challenges that we, we still do have, and, and this is one of one of many. Uh, but you know, one of the things that you obviously want to do um, when uh, you're in the middle of a response is you want to be able to understand you know where your transport routes are, what's blocked off, and and uh, try to be able to do planning around that. Well, roading is still one uh, large or essential uh, issue that we have in, in this country, in, in New Zealand. We haven't got a single source of truth. Uh, we don't really have a open data set. Um, and there's a lot of uncertainty around its accuracy. And in some cases, we don't have great attribution that we need. Um, and uh, it's really interesting uh, when the New Zealand Herald uh, was like trying to analyze this and to um, understand the, the scale of the damage um, and do some analysis on this that um, when they were trying to look to see highway closures and disruptions that they, they ran into some challenges and issues. Um, you know, we, we definitely, um, you know, we had many road closures during the cyclone and uh, thankfully, you know, we're able to, you know, use existing social media and other um, platforms to be able to figure it out, um, you know, through through Facebook, for example, uh, and, and Twitter and, and other government platforms. Um, you know, so, you know, on these like platforms, people are like trying to ask, you know, is this bridge open? You know, can I go across it? Um, you know, uh, the answer as well, I think um, probably only the locals which are like standing there may be uh, able to see line of sight, maybe actually uh, view the definitive information because we had uh, Waka Kotahi with the, um, the state highways information saying that, you know, this, this was uh, where the closures were. And um, then we had some other information that was coming out from the local councils that was saying, uh, this is where uh, closures were. And uh, actually there was discrepancies and uh, between both of them. And so uh, what uh, various community uh, members had to do is actually uh, leverage Google, uh, who was able to put together the full information. Uh, and really this isn't the way that we want to be able to, um, to leverage this information. We really need to have an authoritative national data set in a single place where this information is uh, stored and then also marked up in these types of situations. So I think a real shining light from both the open source and the open data community is, uh, is Riskscape. So Riskscape is software that provides a model framework, framework to be able to quantify natural um, hazard impacts. Um, it's an open source piece of software and um, 
the engine itself is released as, as open source um, a GPL so you can you can grab that software and uh, use it for uh, non-commercial purposes and when you want to actually uh, like host it and use it for commercial purposes then you can uh, work uh, with the um, with the agencies that have put it together it's developed by Niwa GNS Science um, EQC and it's, it's supported by Catalyst IT um, and it really supports um, a whole load of uh, data and models going into it, um, you know, both open data and also data which might not be open, and then applying some uh, some modeling algorithms uh, to solve particular cases. So just like to highlight a couple of um, really good use cases where RiskScape has been used recently. So down in the Queenstown uh, Lakes District Council, they wanted to um, change some land use development policy to better manage uh, rockfall and debris flow. Uh, and RiskScape was used to uh, estimate the current risk exposure. So uh, they, they used RiskScape, they grabbed uh, open data sources, uh, both from council and also uh, national sources. And then they were able to use RiskScape to, to go through and model out some scenarios. And they worked with the community to um, to see what those different scenarios are and what the uh, preventable um, kind of fatalities uh, and also costs could be. And uh, they then use that to select their preferred policy options. So I think that's a really great example of how both open source and open data can be used to inform better decision making. Also, uh, RiskScape is uh, being used uh, up in Auckland, uh, basically in a uh, you know, a proof of concept uh, to really look and evaluate coastal flood risk and, and current uh, zoning rules in Auckland. So taking in, uh, you know, Auckland uh, council information and uh, putting it through, um, you know, modeling identification scenarios and uh, doing that in a temporal way, looking at a different uh, um, basically planning increments, we're able to have a look at what different intensification rates would do and um, then sort of evaluate options in terms of what that means in terms of planning and uh, adaptation options. So going through and, and doing fur further modeling, uh, the, the RiskScape team was able to, to model out the estimated average loss based on certain intensification uh, zoning uh, uh, basically decisions and they came to a conclusion that uh, basically that uh, if there was an adaptation to, to basically to retreat over the coming years then uh, the uh, expected average annual loss from uh, disasters and uh, would basically really ramp up quite large. Uh, this information at the moment is, is just being uh, provided, I guess, as a proof of concept. So it's it's not anything that, that Auckland Council has actually adopted. So getting closer to and dear to my heart um, around uh, property information is um, building rapid assessments. So um, following disasters, you know, such as the cyclone, but we've had quite a few disasters in recent times in New Zealand. Um, we do um, you know, rapid assessments on buildings um, and we generally do that uh, when there's a state of emergency and, and we want to you know, quickly see what's caused damage to buildings. Usually within the first like eight to 48 hours they're done. And the main purpose is just to obtain a broad picture of the type and, and extent of damage that lies within the impacted area. So that helps with further um, you know, response decision making. They're generally led by the TAs, um, so the TAs do them, but they're probably operationally implemented um, by, um, you know, first responding teams, uh, fire and emergency, for example. Um, so these forms here, they come from Ember. You can see that they look um, pretty old school and they're very labor intensive. Um, you know, really what you need to be doing while you're doing these these rapid assessments is really trying to, um, you know, minimise the amount of information that you need to collect while ensuring you get high quality uh, information in there. But as you can see uh, from these forms here, um, there's quite a lot of fields that you need to fill out and certainly uh, quite laborious and a lot of chance for, uh, you know, mis uh, 
you know, uh, basically incorrectly uh, scribing information or transferring information in there, or the way that the information is taken out of the form could cause some, some issues. If you look here, there's a lot of information that could automatically just be populated from existing uh, government sources. You know, we've got New Zealand addresses in there. Uh, we could be using New Zealand building outlines uh, to help out, and we could be using the valuation uh, district role as well to help fill out a lot of the, the building information, but we currently don't do that. And so I think there's a really huge opportunity here for uh, us to really think as a community as to how we can try and you know, optimise this environment and try and uh, you know, get this information available and, and then work across the broader um, you know, system to try and make this stuff easier to do. You can see here that um, on the Slack channel, you know, a lot of people commenting about these um, these rapid uh, assessment forms, <laughs> commenting, you know, that you know some of the data is, is available in uh, in Lynn's addresses, um, and that there's some parcel IDs there, but you know, um, other agencies are also using like core logic addresses, so there isn't a single point of truth there. Um, some people are, are using core logic, um, you know, property data with with uh, with valuation information. And others are using their own valuation information in their council system, and there's a whole lot of confusion and and a lack of overall access and and, and a single um, point of truth to to really point towards. So, it's it is really quite a minefield at the moment, and and you know we really need to be trying to do better to improve this overall situation so that in these critical scenarios that we can uh, we can make these things uh, a little bit more streamlined. So um, iwi leaders have also been looking at options to um, you know to try and improve their prosperity and and well-being for for their iwi members and um, through uh, through work that's been done um, uh, global risk consulting and, and uh, iwi cheerleaders and other government agencies been looking at um, better ways to do that, resulting in putting together um, platforms to be able to allow um, you know, iwi members to have a look at certain metrics across the country to help inform their decision making. So here, uh, a climate platform with a, a set of toolkits has been put together using um, a great amount of, of open data, sea level rise information, emission information, um, you know, Moana, uh, elevation, uh, land use, weather data, all going together into one platform, uh, along with a lot of other foundational geospatial and statistical information to, to really um, measure impact across, you know, economic built, natural, social and cultural environments that have significant importance to, to iwi. Um, a lot of iwi groups, um, you know, uh, got a lot of commercial uh, business. I think a quarter of it uh, relates to, you know, primary industries, you know, farming or, or fishing, and then a lot to uh, to property uh, management. So having these types of tools at their fingerprint uh, at their uh, fingertips really helps drive uh, better decision making, helps them plan into the future. Um, particularly, you know, with the threat of, uh, of climate change and the risks that that brings. Um, so here's just a, another screenshot showing how they're further able to leverage the information on their platform to drill down into into demographic information and into, into areas of particular interest for for their iwi or hapu. And uh, you can see that they're able to get quite rich information that can really help drive some of their decisions and their conversations that uh, they're having. So closer to my home, um, really just want to uh, touch on, uh, I think, quite a, a um, an awesome initiative where we're leveraging both open data um, and trying to improve the open data environment and process uh, for our property system by leveraging open source and open data. So uh, Linz, I, I think, in New Zealand is, is quite lucky to have a, a single national survey and title um, land registry system. It uh, was put together really in the late 90s and the early 2000s and was a huge automation project from paper to electronic and brought together 13 
uh, separate regions that were doing things all in separate ways into one central process and one central system. Um, that technology, uh, of course, has aged over time. So at the moment, we're busily going through and uh, we are re-engineering and we're modernizing it to meet uh, future needs. Uh, as part of this uh, re-engineering process, we've really leveraged open source and uh, we have brought the, the project in-house, which it was a managed external vendor that was providing this, uh, using mostly proprietary solutions and we brought it in-house and we have uh, developed the code all, of our, all ourselves and we have leveraged a huge amount of open source technology, including geospatial technology. So we're using things such as as open layers and GeoServer and an array of other uh, JavaScript uh, uh, libraries and and uh, and toolkits to be able to make this happen, and it's just so fantastic that we're able to be able to bring this in house and to get ourselves into a mode where we're going to be able to sustainably keep evolving this system uh, to to meet our customer requirements. Huge number of benefits have come out of uh, this this work that we've done. Um, we've been able, been able to, to bring it into the web tier. It was a desktop application before that. We've been able to, to work with territorial authorities to get notice of change and sale information into our system. Uh, we've also been able to modernize our UIs and, and streamline our workflows to make things easier for our users. This, this project is, is still in progress, but we've managed to, to get quite a, a large amount of um, benefits already out there um, into the economy. And I think notice of change is just one of those um, large opportunities that we've, we've definitely been able to jump on and, and it's certainly uh, it's been made possible by um, open source software and really, um, you know, a really open collaborative mindset with all of our um, TA vendors. Uh, sorry, our TR partners. So, uh, you know, now we're, we're able to, um, you know, to capture the, um, the sale price as uh, titles transactions is going through. And this really puts us in a great position, I think, uh, for the future to be able to centralize that sales information. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are some policy barriers and some further conversations that need to be put in place. So we're collecting this information going forward. Um, but you know, and we're we're able to um, to make it available back to uh, to TAs. But in terms of you know being able to make this information uh, centrally available for the whole country, we, we still have some challenges to to get through. But um, I think that's that really this foundational work that we're doing here is really setting ourselves up. As you can see in here, we. Um, in our new land and line system, we're having to capture the valuation reference. And the valuation uh, data is, is known for being dispersed across New Zealand, uh, held uh, by uh, various um, other entities, including QV, but other uh, valuation uh, service providers. What Linz has been doing over the last few years is working on a way to bring all of that valuation information together and we're using it here in a first um, implementation to support the notice of change process so that um, basically the solicitor doesn't need to manually type in that valuation reference. They can look it up straight directly linked to the title, which I think is really great news and provides linkages and that information. But the back on you know on the back of that, we've been doing a lot of uh, work, uh, research work, basically bringing together um, a lot of property information sources across um, both LINS, the central government, as well as in the local authorities to see, you know, what is a, um, you know, consistent uh, system model that we could apply for the storage and the management of property information to meet our needs. So we've been looking at that through our property data management framework. And we've been putting uh, internal uh, proof of concept systems in place to look at how we can join that up and how the existing data fits or doesn't fit and what are those challenges in there. So on the screen, you can see our property explorer, which is able to model out how um, all the information currently links together. And we've built this all using uh, open source software and um, you know, we're definitely uh, leveraging it quite a bit to get further understanding as to how we could best set up the overall property information uh, data domain.
so going into the future, you know, given where we are and all the fantastic work that we've done, where, where should we be going? Well, I mean, there's obviously a huge amount of, of data and information available. Um, as I've touched on, I think that there's certainly some challenges in there and in not having all of it you know, open and also not having a single uh, source of truth. A lot of it is fragmented. We've got a lot of data which is still siloed across many um, central and local government agencies. You know, what could we do to best try and improve that scenario? Taking, I think, the experience from, you know, what um, governors learn from doing centralised systems, you know, such as land and line and bringing things together and trying to standardise and to simplify processes, I think that there's a real opportunity in that to think more broadly across the, the whole, um, you know, the whole New Zealand landscape. I think, you know, trying to have a look at providing centralised government information platforms around, you know, key domains, um, you know, process domains that help drive the key decisions that we need to make is, is a really um, important area that we need to explore and uh, to harness where it's already going on. I think, you know, having at the heart of that, looking at those platforms and making sure we are developing end-to-end -end processes that we've got. Uh, open data and open source, um, you know, uh, ingredients in there that we're really looking to drive standardization and interoperability and integration so that we can plug all of our services together and really try and provide seamless, um, you know, seamless experiences for users. I think really that's that's the future that we, we need to look at. Um, as you can see from property, I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of information which um, you know is is missed isn't centralized we don't have a clear view where it is from the start of the development process all the way through to the end uh, you know we could really be looking at in there but i mean definitely we've got huge weaknesses in our transport area um, in our planning urban development area buildings we we also need to be looking at our building space um, environment is, is already starting to look at putting environment or, or climate change platforms in place, but I think we need to, uh, to keep working in that area. And of course, uh, there are many other domains, including uh, things such as health, uh, where we really you know, need to be looking at putting in centralized platforms and trying to drive that, that standardization and the simplification of, of information. It's really, you know, for countries like New Zealand, um, we, we've got a very, very small population base and having a you know, small population base, a reasonably large amount of land to manage, um, not a lot of hands on deck to be able to put all that together. I think we really do um, miss a lot of opportunities by not wanting to or, or not looking at that opportunity to centralise our platforms uh, because that can really provide a lot of enablement uh, for our citizens and also for you know, government to be able to, to drive, you know, better cost efficiencies to try and really get that good informed decision making, uh, really ensuring, you know, that we've got good, you know, single uh, source of truth and data quality um, associated with that information, really trying to drive good interagency collaboration uh, through integration. Um, and, and really uh, making sure that we've got good resilience as well. I, I think time and time again, we look at a lot of our systems are, are managed by maybe one or two people and there's not a lot of, um, you know, there's not a lot of disaster um, management around those systems. And so in times of crisis, you know, you need to get access to this information and, and these processes really quickly. So by having well-managed central platforms, that puts us in a much more mature place to be able to do that. So for me, I think that's the vision of where um, uh, I'd like us to go. And um, yeah, I really hope over the, um, you know, the coming days, you, you guys are able to discuss that a little bit more and, and uh, you know, maybe uh, critique, you know, what's, what's good and bad about that type of approach. Uh, in putting together this presentation, I uh, had a lot of help and I really just want to uh, call out uh, three individuals, uh, Ryan, Richard, Chris, who were able to help me with uh, some of the, the case studies. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, really appreciative. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, time for a few questions. But if you want to contact me, uh, there's my email address. You can probably also look me up on the spatial community on, on the Slack workspace as well. Um, 
Lindsay just going through a bit of a restructure at the moment. So um, I was director of data when this uh, um, keynote was put together, but now I've moved into lead of geospatial technology uh, across our organization. And I'm also uh, be taking on a dual role around our property data lead as well, which um, I'm really looking forward to. So yeah, any questions uh, from the audience? Well, first of all, thank you Jeremy for joining us. Um, Question over here. Uh, you can hear us okay? Can you hear us, Jeremy? No, I can't. I can't. I can hear you, um, Hamish, but I can't hear oh, someone okay, in the Jeremy. audience. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I should. I should mention. Um, so, um, our lovely AV team uh, is recording all of the fly, all the presentations, and clips, and, and they'll all be published uh, through the YouTube. Post event, so um, all of the content will be available for free. Sorry, Jeremy, we're just waiting for a, for a microphone to kind of be sorted out. But um, yep. it's hard to understate the impact um, of um, Jeremy um, and Lynn's uh, generally on the uh, uh, the landscape of um, of data in New Zealand. And it, it's sort of notable when I travel overseas that um, that Lynn's is uh, often mentioned as um, a world leader um, in in geospatial data. Um, right, is that your camera? Do we know? Yes, yeah, I can hear. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, uh, thanks uh, so much for that, Jeremy. I work here at AUT at the School of Computing and Environments, and uh, there's a good portion of um, architecture and construction and design which is still done in, in, in very proprietary systems, um, very closed data formats. Uh, and it's clear from your presentation and just from the, 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 the greater community here at large that you seem to be a lot further along with a more open philosophy. And I'm just wondering in your experience, um, insights or thoughts on how to start to get parts of the sector to transition to that more open uh, philosophy. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I'm not sure if I've necessarily got an answer for it. Um, you know, definitely in that building construction area, there's, um, you know, there's there's a couple of big uh, players, particularly in the software environment, which are controlling file formats and, and processes, which I think makes it um, quite challenging. I, I think definitely from, you know, my understanding, and I have certainly haven't been there since the inception of the, you know, the geospatial or the open GIS kind of community is that there was really a huge um, early um, swelling of a lot of people that really wanted to work in that open space with geospatial technology. So I think prior to um, the organization now Open Geospatial Consortium, there was an open GIS, GIS consortium. And a lot of people came together across uh, the IT industry that had interest in, in geospatial and really put together um, standards to drive interoperability across database systems. Um, and then later moved into, you know, how that information can be shared and, and put onto the web. And I think, you know, that, that community that came together um, should be really hugely thanked for a lot of the, I guess, the broader, I guess, openness and the open philosophy that we've got going. Um, now a lot of work still continues today through OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium which drives the creation of, of uh, open specifications for file formats, you know, for example, like um, uh, GeoTIFF um, is, as well as a huge array of other web standards. And, and they do that by being really inclusive of communities, but also uh, managing to, to work with uh, a lot of software vendors. Um, so they work with a lot of software uh, vendors as well as developers to try and make pragmatic solutions that are going to be adopted and put into software. And I think, um, you know, having that whole environment and that whole philosophy really, um, you know, does does set up the broader geospatial community quite well. So, yeah, something like that would probably have to occur in the engineering construction space. But yeah, boy, there's probably some challenges to get there. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Jeremy. I, I think we have no more questions. Um, 
uh, we really appreciate your time, and it's just a shame you couldn't be here today, but uh, we hope to see you in person again sometime soon. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Uh, one more round of applause, please, for Jeremy. Right, so as thanks, mentioned... Hi, everyone. Oh. <laughs> Sorry to cough <laughs> uh, So as